I gradually became aware. I began to feel sensations all over my body. I felt a jolt and my thoughts became clearer. My heart started to beat and I took a slow deep breath filling my lungs to their maximum before letting it out just as slowly. Remembering how to wake up from biosuspension was becoming easier the more I did it. I tried to tilt my head back knowing the tube in my throat would soon be withdrawn. When that finally happened I waited breathing slowly for my lungs to clear and my throat to moisten. Only then did I slowly open my eyes. A small bright light was in front of me. The familiar glowing screen was gone. Strange. The crash seemed smaller somehow also. I waited a bit more and heard the feminine sounding artificial voice speak deep in my thoughts. John Abrams, all is well, all is well. I thought about those words memories came flooding back. The stealthy missions I had done on the various islands of the Galapagos. The preparation and actual lightning fast raid on the enemy base. My being injured by the enemy, but surviving to be treated by Omu. All is well. That also meant that we were still safe and undetected from the master artificial intelligence. I felt myself relaxing where before I would have grown tense with questions. You are still in the medical crash aboard the Nautilus. Once again, you have fully functional limbs, the voice said. I flexed my left arm and fist. It felt normal. I did the same with my right just to compare the sensations. They were identical. Good. I am now rendering you unconscious again to complete your revival and recovery. I will see you soon. I started to fade. Revival. Something about that nagged at me. What was it though? I again fell unconscious. I awoke quickly feeling rested and full of energy. I opened my eyes. This time the crash felt the correct size. Had I been moved, the familiar display screen was back in front of me like it should have been. It was blank except for the word, beware. What the hell? The medical crash lid began to open. I quickly noticed that the chamber beyond was black. I sat up and looked around the dark chamber, confused. Naomi? Oh, moo. No response. What the hell? The dim light from the open crash barely lit the floor of the medical chamber. I hopped out of the treatment basin and padded over to the sealed hatch. It did not open. Had there been a computer failure or a power loss of some sort? The room was also missing any clothing for me to wear. Strange. Maybe Omu was gone on some mission back to Baltra Island? I pulled the manual latch and slid open the door. The corridor beyond was pitch black, except for an intermittent strobing light of some sort coming from the salon. What the hell is going on? Was it an electrical short or failure? Had there been an accident? I was about to step into the corridor when I saw a moving shadow in the flickering light. Something was coming quickly from the salon. I peeked around the hatchway and saw a black xenomorph bounding towards me. It hissed loudly when it saw me, and I spotted its long metallic fangs. Jesus, I jumped back, scrambling around the end of the crash just as the short little xenomorph stuck its head into the medical chamber. Fuck, what do I do? Wait a minute, short? Happy Halloween, John, the little xenomorph yelled. Trick or treat. Oh, mo, God damn it, Omu. Oh, the adrenaline was coursing through my system and my heart was racing. Omu oh, took off the long black insectoid-like headpiece. Her normal mannequin-like android face was illuminated with a large grin. Do you like my costume? Look, its extendable inner jaws even work. She demonstrated the costume head's working jaw motions. The metallic inner jaws did indeed shoot out and bite with a click, just like she described. I just stood there, still in a bit of shock. Very nice, and ah, um, I finally said flatly. Where are my clothes? Omu frowned and put one of her hands on her hip. Sometimes you are no fun, John Abrams. I started chuckling at her. She threw the costume head at me, which got me laughing harder. Luckily, the fake head was very light. The lights returned to normal, and she spun around and went to my berth. Her body's projected images changed, and now she again looked like the cute anime character I always preferred. I followed her into my berth and found her holding up a large pair of Peter Pan tights. Here are your clothes. I started laughing again. Well, I guess I deserved a little hazing for spoiling her fun, so I put on the damn tights. The green tunic followed. Omu smiled when I stood at the mirror flexing. The tights felt pretty good. 
I turned to her and stood in the traditional pond pose, legs spread, hands on hips. She tossed a green hat with a red feather at me. It completed my costume. So I take it that it is October 31st? Yes, John, it is 8.15, Tuesday, October 31st, 2930. You have been undergoing treatment and recovery for 10 days, she answered. So all is going well over at the launch complex? Yes, John, all damaged equipment and data lines have been repaired. All debris has been removed or hidden. The wireless network is again fully operational. Our quadruped assault units have filled in for the former enemy units destroyed during our attack so that the facility's productivity has been maintained. Cool. And my arm has been repaired fully. Yes, as good as new. Because it is new, silly, she answered. What about the clone that provided the new arm? Is it okay? What did you do with it? I asked in a rush. It's fine and whole. The only thing I did to it was to scare the crap out of it when it awakened. I blinked a bit as I digested that. When I fully realized what she had just said, I looked over my body. My new body. Yes, John. You are currently in one of the spare clone bodies. Your damaged body was mind data scanned and your presence was transferred into the clone. The clone was then revived as normal. You're welcome, by the way, for lugging your unconscious new body up here so you would awaken in familiar surroundings. Thank you, I said distractedly, still inspecting my new body. That's okay. I had to haul your old damaged carcass down below anyway. It died, I asked, finally looking up. No, it's fine. It still has the missing limb, which will take quite some time to regrow. I could rush it in an emergency, but it's easier on that body to let it regrow slowly. I thought of that. I was down below sleeping while regrowing a new arm. Weird. A sudden thought struck me. Did you wipe its mind? Omo looked at me a bit before answering. Was she going to answer? No, it was left with your memories intact. If awakened, it would be the you that went to sleep ten days ago, she finally said. Are you okay with that? I thought about it. I wondered what would happen in the future if both of us were awake at the same time. Or what if the old body was never needed? Would Naomi just unplug it and let it die? What a strange thing to consider. I guess I am for now. I'm out. Not really sure, Omu. Well, it's nothing you have to worry about for now, John. Since this body is afresh, I would recommend you spend the day with occasional light exercise sessions. We will be returning to the island facility tonight as I assume you will want to get off the boat for a while. I have prepared an assortment of clothing and other items for your quarters there. They will be crude for a time, but no worse than a camping trip. Please inspect the gear and feel free to add to or alter what has been provided. What will you be doing in the meantime? I asked, wondering if she needed my help. Shit detail, she said as she left my berth. I later found that she meant that literally as she was helping to clean and dismantle the former bat cave in the Port Sponson. An hour after dark, Omu and I were on board Habu and flying across the ocean heading towards Baltra Island. Packed aboard was a gear bag that contained my clothing and other supplies I would need for a few days until the fabricators caught up enough to get me better outfitted on the base. We were also transporting Naomi's second suitcase processor. Since the launch control processor ate itself when it suicided, Naomi needed to take over that role herself until new hardware could be constructed. She indicated that she thought she had recovered enough launch data from the old processor to fulfill its duties properly. I guess we would find out for sure during the first launch. I hoped to be well away from ground zero when that occurred. 20 minutes later, we were overflying Santa Cruz Island. Our altitude was around 1,200 meters, so we passed over the radar installation on Cerro Crocker fairly closely. The data overlay on the inside of the cockpit showed a well-lit real-time image of the mountaintop combined with a plethora of additional digital information. I spotted a dozen mobile units hard at work and asked Omu about them. Those units are updating and improving the taps and equipment you installed three weeks ago. Omu did a quick orbit around the peak and pointed out just what work the units were doing. The main change was the microwave link I had installed was now being replaced with a larger and stronger antenna. Also, this new antenna was mounted on one of the two existing towers. There was no reason to hide it as adding the link was explained as general facility improvements to the area. Only the last few kilometers of undersea fiber direct to Nautilus was still hidden from the master AI. 
We continued northeast and descended towards the launch facility. Omu still had control of Habu and looped us around to the east and out over the Pacific so that we would first approach the island by overflying the launch pad and its connecting causeway. From a few kilometers away, the pad was lit up with digital augments in the cockpit image. I temporarily disabled the artificial enhancements. Without them, the launch area was very dark, with just half a dozen small lights scattered about. I was reminded that this place was designed for robotic workers, where the visual spectrum was just one of many. I restored the digital augments and began inspecting the pad. Unlike the human launch pads from back when with their massive concrete ramps and tall metal towers, this pad was much flatter and simpler. Where the causeway and pier ended more than a half kilometer out from the edge of the island, there was a circular hardened launch platform about 80 meters in diameter. The platform was on massive pilings, which held it at least 12 meters above the surface of the bay. The pier was supported by a combination of pilings near the platform before transitioning to a causeway on a graded earth berm covered with rock riprap as it approached the island. We approached low over the launch platform and hovered near its edge. I saw a series of flame openings in the circular platform. The openings were ringed with heavy supports for securing the launch vehicle's booster stage. There were also numerous bridging beams across the opening aligned with the long, straight roadway heading towards shore. The beams looked movable, and I suspected that they would be swung out of the way of the rocket's exhaust during launch. Although there was no gantry, I did see a ring-shaped track around the perimeter of the circular platform. On this track was mounted a pair of long, extendable arms tipped with manipulators. The arms were currently stowed, retracted, and flush with the platform surface. They and the ring-shaped track were covered with a series of scorch marks indicating that they had already borne the fires from many launches. Running from the platform back to shore along the bridge and causeway was a wide, flat roadway. It looked to be about 20 meters wide and perfectly straight. I did not see any rails or other types of transport track, so the rockets must have been brought out to the pad on a wheeled vehicle of some sort. That sure is one straight and level road, Omu. I suspect you will be interested in the road surfacing, John. We will land to allow you a closer look. Habu resumed flying west along the narrower pier portion of the road until we came to the causeway. Here there was enough room beside the roadbed for Habu to land. I wondered why Omu had not landed on the roadway itself. I left the cockpit and joined Omu next to the flat and straight road. Up close I saw that it was not a single smooth ribbon of paving, but instead was a series of flat tiles. Each was a half meter square and almost perfectly flush with its neighbors. I sighted along the edge of the road. It was indeed perfectly straight and led right into the massive long assembly building further to the west. Use caution on the road surface, John. I put one foot on it and found it was as slippery as wet ice. Frictionless? I asked as I gingerly shuffled my way onto the surface. Very near to it, John. When combined with similar frictionless skids on the lower surfaces of the launch vehicle's support legs, drag is virtually eliminated. The roadbed also contains magnetic couplers, which guide the movement of both the large launch vehicle and the smaller service unit, which use the roadway to access the launch pad. Pretty neat. I slid along for a bit. The gaps between the tiles were a few centimeters wide, and I was able to get a bit of traction by digging my toe into them as needed. I made my way back to the road's edge just in time to see a large mobile unit go flying by with a whoosh of displaced air. It was near the center of the roadway, so we were in no danger. The unit in the cargo pallet it was pulling had no wheels, but still managed to slide along without much sound. We got back on board Habu and flew another 300 meters west until we landed just short of the large assembly building. Here, off to the north of the frictionless road, was an armored pillbox-looking building. Omu exited her storage bay, lugging the portable processor. I follow her around to the backside of the squat structure to where a large armored access hatch stood open. There were a number of small mobile units going in and out of the bunker, and we had to wait our turn. Finally, I followed Omu inside. Inside was full of activity. New equipment was being installed and fastened into place by automated welders. Replacement wiring was being strung and tied into the remains of the existing data runs. New cameras and sensors were being installed behind armored shutters facing the launch pad. This must be where the launch processor used to be housed. 
A few seconds later, this was confirmed when Omu got busy installing Naomi's portable processor at the junction of all the data conduits. The smelly fumes in the chamber were leaking through my stealth suit's mask, so I went outside to clear and reseal it. When I was about to re-enter, Omu exited and said we were all done here. She pointed at the nearby assembly building and asked if I wanted to walk through it and take a quick tour on the way to my quarters. Habu could fly itself over to a hangar where it would be stored. Hell yes, I wanted to see inside. I would advise that you continue to wear your respirator mask when possible, John. There are trace gases in some manufacturing areas and low levels of radioactivity in others. Both are potentially harmful if ingested or breathed. I am conducting a better cleanup of those areas soon and hope the area will become much safer for you in the near future," she explained as we walked. The assembly building's massive launch vehicle doors where the causeway road started were currently closed, so we instead entered through a smaller side door. I say smaller, but it was still large enough that I could have easily flown Habu through its opening. I paused after I stepped inside. There was some lighting, and that combined with my goggles' enhanced view had the cavernous interior well lit up. This final assembly area was enormous. Starting at the huge doors, the cavernous room was 200 meters wide, with the underside of the curved roof at least 100 meters above the floor. The depth of the room was almost lost in the distance, though it stepped down both in width and height the further it went to the west, exaggerating the appearance of greater distance. This largest section extended for over 200 meters, and I was reminded of those enormous hangars of old, back when the Navy had dabbled with large, rigid airships. Besides its large size, the building was strongly constructed with roof arches supporting many gigantic lifting cranes. These were clearly used to stack the various parts of a launch vehicle into something resembling a huge, tapered layer cake. Then the finished cake was slid out the big door and down the frictionless road to the launch pad a kilometer to the east. Currently, only the bottom of the layer cake waited here. Omu explained that this was the chemical, solid-fueled booster stage. The stage was circular at around 20 meters in diameter and stood just under 5 meters tall. Next to it was a large gantry spanning across the booster, which held some manner of large spray applicator head. It was currently being repaired or serviced by an assortment of mobile units. Here inside the assembly building, the slippery floor tiles were larger than those outside. They also had wider gaps, which I used to safely walk up next to the side of the booster. The exterior casing appeared to be a dull metal, and I saw that there was a 20 centimeter gap between the casing and the slick tile. Something was suspending the giant hockey puck of the booster above the floor. The exterior shell is a tensioned lithium aluminum alloy sleeve, John. Inside this sleeve are the smaller circular fuel elements. Encapsulating these elements and forming a rigid monolithic structure is more lithium aluminum alloy in the form of sintered metallic foam. Hollow glass spheroids are embedded into this metallic foam matrix as a form of aggregate, which performs insulating, lightning, and structural functions. Okay, I'd have to learn what all that was later. For now, I did what all simple grunt humans would do. I smacked it hard with my palm. It felt solid like concrete. Oh, Moo caught this and said, no tires to kick, John, but feel free to urinate on it and mark it as your own if you wish. I don't have to go right now, thank you, I replied, deadpan. I made my way around the booster perimeter until I came to a large protrusion. This was made from a shinier metal and projected outward a few meters from the curved wall of the main cylinder. It was tapered and had a wide base in contact with the frictionless floor tiles. This must be one of the main support legs for the launch vehicle and explain the main cylinder being suspended above the floor. The projecting foot was a meter wide and tapered. I continued around another 120 degrees until I found a second, similar support. Sure enough, there was a third further on. Three enormous metal feet. I realized that the three legs would align with the heavily built contact points out on the launch pad we had overflown earlier. I looked towards Omu. The support legs and foot structures are constructed of a sintered stainless steel alloy. The three ground contact pads are connected to one another by an internal triangular support truss structure extending through the circular booster mass, she explained. Together, the truss structure and the three legs easily support the mass of the entire assembled launch vehicle. I noted the outer surface of the sintered stainless steel foot and pedestal was ribbed, 
forming a complex arrangement of triangular voids, probably to save weight. They would make a decent ladder. Can I climb up to the top? I asked. Sure. Keep to the shiny spots on the upper surface, however. I started up, keeping to the outer face of the pedestal. This face tapered inward the full two meters as it rose towards the upper edge of the five meter high main ring, making my ladder an easy climb. When I reached the top, I saw that the upper surface was mostly flat, like a 20 meter pancake. The steel pedestal I was climbing on terminated a few centimeters above the rest of the circular mass. This raised portion was half a meter wide and extended across the top, forming beams running to the other two support pedestals. This must be the upper surface of the triangular trusses Omu had mentioned. Picture a large pancake with a raised equilateral triangle on top and you have it. The non-truss upper surfaces were more of the dull centered aluminum and lithium metal foam. This smooth surface was interrupted by a geometric arrangement of shallow pits. The pits were joined by tubes or conduits running in shallow recessed trenches. I counted 55 pits. Omu most have been monitoring my goggles and noted what I was inspecting as she spoke up from below. The pits are for igniting the solid chemical fuel booster elements. Below each pit is one element of the 55 total that form the booster's propulsive mass. Each element is a cylinder about two meters across by just under five tall. They are arranged geometrically around the circular booster except where the support truss crosses. I climbed to the upper surface and stood. It felt like I was standing on the edge of a short oil storage tank. I made my way across the top to one of the other corner pedestals by following the truss. There I carefully began to climb down. As I did, I saw that the ignition conduits terminated in the pedestal at a mating connection, which must allow for linking to the next upper stage of the launcher. There was also a large physical connection assembly with a heavy retracting latch. Is this booster fueled and ready to go? I asked as I climbed back down. Yes, John. The fuel elements are in place. Wow, I had walked across one big firecracker. How much thrust does this baby make? Over 6,000 metric tons. Note that this thrust is short-lived with the booster exhausting its solid fuel load in just over 30 seconds at an altitude of around 1,100 meters. The upper stages coast on a few hundred meters higher before its fusion propulsion bomblets begin detonating, taking the craft to orbit, she explained. I had reached the floor and carefully stepped back off the slippery grid. Omu led me north from the booster where an opening in the large assembly chamber indicated a connected smaller building. This wing was clearly for booster production. As we walked northward alongside another slick floor track, we came upon a large gantry in cradle assembly. Here I could see another booster. This one had been flipped upside down and I could now see the 55 fuel element cells. Some were empty while others had had their solid fuel installed and the cells capped with a metallic restriction nozzle. One of the cells was in the process of being filled an overhead gantry was supporting a large extruder of some sort working in the open cell. Another articulated arm was holding a large flexible duct and intake, capturing the vapors and fumes which escaped. It was quite a loud process, so Omu used my implant to explain. The solid fuel is deposited onto the thin metallic tension liner of each cell. Instead of fully filling each cell solid, a star-shaped flame channel is left. This allows for rapid combustion and increased chamber pressures. Once the cells are filled and properly cured, the cells are capped off with a short ablative nozzle. You know, we watched for a moment before heading further north. The next station was a similar large moving gantry. This was busy forming the main aluminum and lithium booster mass itself. The steel truss and support pedestal assembly were already in place. The station's moving forming head was slowly depositing alloy and glass aggregate. Bright flashes and raising vapors indicated that the head was laser centering the alloy substrate, solid as it was deposited. When the forming head would reach a fuel cell, the metal became less foam and more solid. Omo explained that this was because the cell had to contain the chamber pressures of the burning cell. We stood and watched the busy machine working. The large size of the booster meant that this would take days. How fast can you make a booster, Omu? I asked. Four days at maximum. We are currently operating at a much slower deposition rate, however, as the quality is much higher. At this slower rate, production will take seven days. The projected failure rate for a four-day booster is 
At the current slower rate, the failure rate is one quarter of 1% or less. I look towards the next station. This one was a series of jigs and extruders for forming the three-sided stainless steel truss and pedestals. Now that it was exposed on its own, I saw that this part was more complicated than I had first imagined. The nearly 20 meter to a side triangular truss was an intricate extrusion full of lightning holes, webs, and recesses. It also had structural branches extending both inward and outward to all points of the 20 meter diameter booster. Omu told me that the stronger steel truss acted as a backbone as it wove through and crossed the lighter lithium aluminum foam matrix, providing reinforcement and tension support. We watched for a few minutes as this station's extruder and sintering head deposited the stainless steel powder and hardened it into the ultra-complicated shape. The work in progress had an almost organic sculpture look to it. I mentioned this to Omu and commented that I was surprised that with such a complicated interior, the outside of the booster was just a simple circular shape. She reminded me that the outer skin of the cylinder was a tension membrane that contained both the fuel elements and filler matrix under high compression. The compression allowed the stack to remain rigid and fairly short in comparison to the pressures generated inside. Thus, the circular shape was needed for that reason. We stopped our tour of the booster wing at that point. The rest of the structure was devoted to the production and storage of the various powdered metal substrates and glass spheroids. As we walked back to the main hall, I asked Omu if the booster stage crashed back into the ocean after its motors burned out. It is shattered in midair when the first of the fusion pulses impact its upper surface, John. What remains falls to the ocean and sinks to the bottom well east of the island, she replied. Is it a radiation hazard? I asked. A minimal one. The induced radiation on the booster's remains is very small. Notice the action now taking place on the first booster you stood upon. We had returned to the main assembly hall. The gantry, which was being serviced a few minutes ago, was now moving towards the nearby booster. As we watched, it reached the edge and the spray heads began covering the upper surface of the booster cylinder with a foamy layer of dark gray paint. The unit is spraying a radiation shield on the upper surface of the booster. The spray is a foam composed of epoxy, boron, and graphene. A 70 millimeter thick layer will greatly reduce the amount of neutron flux reaching the booster's metal structure, she explained. We moved deeper into the building. The next intersection we came to was where the fusion-powered main propulsion sections were constructed. The intersection had wings extending to both the north and the south of the main assembly hall. The north wing was larger and was where the main structure of the stage was constructed. The south wing was where the fusion bomblets were constructed. We started with the north. First, we walked up to a nearly completed stage. This was again a cylindrical base about 20 meters in diameter. Its sides were tapered instead of straight like the booster stage. They tapered up to a flat upper surface 18 meters above the floor. I noticed right away that this stage appeared to have two different types of construction, with the lower four meters being a darker, duller material than the upper's more metallic looking skin. I asked Omu about it. Go up and smack the lower section, John. I just stood there thinking she was giving me more grief about having done just that on the booster. She made motions as if rolling her eyes. I am serious, John. Go smack it. Well, okay then. I made my way across the slippery tiles and laid a good swat on it. It was like slapping concrete. I leaned close and looked close with my goggles. No way! I found my smaller flashlight and took off my goggles. In the bright light, I inspected the material closely with my own eyes. I saw small stone chips and pebbles embedded in some sort of clear binder. I suddenly remembered where I had seen this before. Agent's underground base. Is that really? Yes, it is concrete. Well, this is much more advanced than your earthly concrete, which uses Portland cement. This material uses a clear molecularly bonded binding agent. The lower portion of this stage is constructed of a large thickness of the material to provide shielding from the nearby fusion explosions, she explained. I could see metallic looking filaments running near the surface. They appeared to be woven into the matrix. I asked if they were reinforcing wires of some sort. They provide some reinforcement, although their primary function is to form and maintain the magnetic field, which extends below the stage, acting as a dampener and shield. The filaments are superconductors. 
As a side function, they moderate and distribute the heat absorbed by the lower shield plate, she said. I shone my light up to the metallic portion about two stories above me. It looked more like what I would expect the exterior of a spacecraft to look like. It had a series of one to two meter square hatches installed in its slightly tapered side, possibly indicating floors or levels inside. In addition to their vertical separation, the hatches were staggered around the perimeter with the next higher hatch being 10 degrees or so rotated around the cylinder from the one below it. Why so many hatches? They are fuel loading ports, one for each fuel storage deck, Omu explained. I counted five hatches, five decks for fuel. I was curious how they must have been arranged on the inside. Can we see inside? Yes, we will have to access the interior from above though, as each fuel deck is too short to allow for easy movement. I will summon a lift platform. Rather quickly, a mobile unit that resembled a workman's scissor lift approached. We climbed on, I noticed no guardrails, so I knelt and hung onto the edges of the lift platform. Ohmu just stood there. She was kind enough to not mention my nervousness as we rose over 15 meters. The platform extended sideways a few meters until it contacted the side of the tapered stage. This level was near the top of the stage and had a larger door than the fuel ports below. It hinged open and I followed Omu inside. She walked while I gingerly crawled. No, I did not look over the edge of the platform. While I crawled, I distracted myself by asking what this part of the stage was constructed of. Mostly the same aluminum lithium alloy as the booster stage. Both metals are easily procured by extraction from seawater or by harvesting the metal-rich nodules laying on the seafloor near the many undersea thermal vent, extending off to the northwest. Unlike the booster, which was constructed using additive manufacturing, this stage is constructed of thin plate sections, fusion welded to form stringers, and beam supports in a fashion similar to how humans once produced your aerospace craft. We had finally entered the stage, so I stood. Osmu had instructed a few mobile units and aerial drones to be waiting inside. These had lighting beams shining, and the interior of the stage was well lit. I turned off my goggle overlay and stood. I quickly noted the lack of amenities for any human occupants, as the space was filled with complex-looking equipment and more crude-looking plumbing and wiring. We moved to the center of the stage. Here was a well in the floor. I peered over the edge and saw that it must have extended all the way down to the level of the floor outside, although a great deal of complicated machinery interrupted many parts of the drop. John, this is the central laser well and fuel bomblet dispenser and launcher. The three pipes ringing the well leading downward are the redundant compression-inducing lasers. These ignite the fusion bomblet once it has dropped far enough below the stage. The central device is the fuel bomblet extractor and linear accelerator. This retrieves bomblets from each fuel deck below and accelerates them downward at great velocity. At the shield mass level at the bottom, the bomblets pass through a fast-acting rotary shutter. The shutter is closed during each bomblet detonation to protect the interior of the stage from the thermal and radiation pulse before opening to allow the next bomblet to pass. The rigid lattice around the central well is part of the superconducting filament grid below and also establishes a magnetic field around the central core. The lattice is strong enough to support you if you wish to climb down to fuel storage levels below, she explained. I looked and indeed, the lattice looked strong enough to work as a ladder. I saw where there were openings large enough to climb on or off the circular lattice at each level. What the hell? I turned on my goggles just in case and proceeded to enter the open shaft. It made for a decent ladder and I quickly made my way a few meters lower to the first of the five fuel decks. I rotated around the lattice until I was able to exit the central well and enter the deck. Ahead of me was a winding curved passage. I had to crawl as the deck was barely more than a meter tall. The winding path also had a frictionless floor and after I felt it to be sure, a frictionless ceiling as well. As I crawled away from the central core, the path continued to curve around counterclockwise sharply. A few more meters and I saw that it would eventually spiral completely around the central well. I stopped crawling and looked back. Omu was behind me a few meters and must have known what I was about to assess. Yes, it spirals around completely forming eight increasing rings before terminating at one of the fuel loading ports you saw from the exterior. The length of each deck's spiral path is almost 300 meters. This allows for each deck to contain over 200 fuel bomblets in a link belt. 
As the fuel bomblets are expended, the link belt draws new fuel in from this spiral storage path. I looked over the frictionless floor and ceiling again, realizing how they would allow such a large link belt easy movement. The walls of the spiral tunnel had rotating cogs which would drive the mechanism. I would have to inspect the bomblets to be sure, but I thought I had a good idea about how the mechanism worked. It was simple and rugged, and I realized that it had to be to prevent jams from happening. A single jam would equal a launch failure. I've seen enough. Let's go back to the top. We retreated, crawling backward. I waited while Omu re-entered the central lattice and made her way up. I managed to follow without slipping or wrecking anything. Soon, we were back on the upper deck. I continued looking around the deck, but did not find the expected answer. So I asked where the power came from to operate the lasers, the linear accelerator, and the fuel loader. The energy comes from over a dozen deaths, John. I looked around confused. I did not see any of the dual entangled tunnel or power transfer devices anywhere. Also, a dozen. That meant the vehicle needed over 500 megawatts of electrical power to operate. They are not located on this stage, Omu answered, reading my puzzled expression. The DETs are located in the nose cone stage. Since DETs are so difficult to create, they are reused for each launch. The DETs for this launch vehicle are currently still in orbit. They will be returning in approximately two days. That was news to me. I'd have to find out more about that later. Why does the spacecraft need so much electrical power? I asked. The primary user is the superconducting magnetic dampener shield. This uses three quarters of the DET energy. The compression lasers also use a considerable amount. The electrical energy is also used for plasma thrusters once the fusion detonation stage is released. You mean this whole stage is a one-shot? It burns up or something? I asked. No, the fusion bomblet stage above the heavy base shield is delivered to the orbital station along with the cargo module. There, both modules are reduced and their elements utilized for other in-orbit construction. I guess that made sense considering how easily and quickly the launch vehicles were constructed and how reusable their components were in space. I looked around for a minute longer and then signaled that we could leave. Once the lift platform was on the ground, I sheepishly told Omu that I needed to take a leak. She gave me some shit about wanting to mark the spacecraft as my own, but then said that a unit was coming to pick us up and take me to my quarters. While I stood there waiting, I yawned. I looked at my smartwatch and was shocked to see that it was half an hour past midnight. But a minute later, a fast little mule-like mobile cart drove up. It was a flat bed, so I lay face down and gripped each side with my hands and hooked my toes over the end. Omu actually climbed on top of me and hung onto my shoulders. I bet we hit 30 kilometers per hour as we whizzed down the long, dark assembly building. Near the western end, the cart stopped quickly and we got off. Omu led me to a small chamber near the outer wall, which had been set aside for my temporary residence. Inside, I found a portable toilet and was finally able to relieve myself. I looked around the chamber and saw there was an air mattress complete with bedding, a small sink and counter, and a table and chair. On the table were an electric cooler and a crate of prepared foods. I opened the cooler and got out a bottle of chilled water. The room looked like it had the basics, my gear bag had been brought here and was sitting by the end of the mattress. Looks like I'm all set, Omu. Will we be able to continue the tour tomorrow? I asked. Yes, John. I will leave you to your rest. Sleep as late as you like. Your watch has access to the local data net, so just speak if you need anything. I would advise that you wear earplugs when you sleep, as the activity in the factory outside never ceases, and although your quarters are in the quiet end, noise still travels. Good night, my friend, I mean, she said while leaving. She closed the door behind her, which canceled out most of the noise. There was a small lamp on the bedside table. So I took off my suit and goggles. I debated on whether to just wipe myself down or use the portable shower. The shower went out and I took a quick one, noting that water was hot, but the pressure was weaker than it had been back on board my sub. I was hungry, but decided to tough it out until morning and 10 minutes later fell into a deep sleep. 